Welcome, everybody. Please put away your laptops. <sighs> okay. One quick reminder. Uh, the project on ERM is due today. You may want to use some, some late days. Uh, I looked at the top scoring teams and uh, I really like, people have done very principled things to, to get to the top, so it's, it's very, very nice. I will maybe donate some time uh, after the spring break to talk about the winning, uh, give the winners some chance to kind of explain what they did, but it uh, seems like they really know what they're doing. Any questions about logistics? Days to try and aim for the top of the leaderboard? Sure. <laughs> okay, any other questions? All right. Um, okay, so we've been talking about bias variance trade off. And so a few lectures ago, we basically established that the error in machine learning decomposes into these three terms, you know, the noise, bias, and variance. And what we will do now is basically try to debug or give you tools to kind of address each one of these uh, carefully. So last lecture, we talked about how to identify if your problem is a high bias problem, high variance problem, or neither one of these, then it's a high noise problem. Um, and now we're getting into how do we combat these, and we are focusing for now on high bias. Right? So high bias, can anyone tell me how you, diagno uh, how you diagnose high bias? What happens when you have high bias? How do you recognize it? Who remembers? Yeah? High training error. High training error, and the small gap between training and, and testing error. That's the important part, right? So, your training error in some sense is already too high, and your test error is actually not much worse, right? So the problem is not the gap between training and, and, and testing, which is variance, right, which is the high variance, but instead actually is that your classifier itself can't even do it on the training data set, right? So that's clearly high bias. <coughs> well, it could also be attributed to noise, but um, typically it's high bias. So one thing <coughs> we did last time is we said, well, I give you this very simple problem where we said, we have these circles in the middle, and then we have crosses around it, and we said, well, we really want to use a linear classifier because we just get a discount on SVMs. And uh, how can we apply a linear SVM on this data set? And turns out this way it doesn't work, right? There's no way you can kind of divide these into crosses and, and, and nods. But one thing you can do if you just do a, uh, add some features, so in this case, actually, if you take x1, x2, and you would just add some features, for example, X1, you know, one person actually suggested co polar coordinates, but, you know, you could also just add, for example, X1 squared, X2 squared, or the sum of those two, right? That's the same thing, because if you assign weights to those, you sum them up. And then actually suddenly this becomes linearly separable, right? And it's really, really easy. It's a really easy problem. So that leaves, uh, makes us believe, well, maybe that's what we should do, right? So maybe one good way of addressing high bias is just adding more features. And... You know, of course, if, you have a, if you're a data specialist, you could maybe extract more features from the data by basically, for instance, you have house prices, maybe also get the school district or something, or the average grades of the school district or something. That's one, that's the kind of the data um, creation part. We're looking at the just, you know, that's that you have some features already, can we somehow combine these features to create some, you know, to capture the nonlinear interactions between different features. One idea, so in this case, it's, it's simple. We can actually look at the data and we can just figure it out ourselves. It's more like a puzzle. Usually that's not the case, right? Usually you cannot just plot the data and just, you know, futz around with it. Instead, you know, you actually have to do, you know, um, you know let's say the data is 100 dimensional. Well, you wouldn't really know how to visualize that in that way. So one thing is if you just try to model all the different interactions between different features. So one idea is we have this vector, vector x1 to xd and one thing I proposed is we say, well, what we do is we just add features between, of any possible interaction between any of these features. So the first one is just a constant. That means no interaction between any features. And we 
you know, we say, okay, this is just the feature itself. And then we take any square terms. So x1 times x2, x1 times x3, and so on, x1 times xd, and we have x2 times x3, and so on. And we keep making, you know, all th uh, three-way multiplications until at the end we get x1 times, times xd. And uh, that seems like a good thing and probably captures a lot of the, you know, uh, possible nonlinearities you could have in your data set. So that's very effective at decreasing bias. But there's one downside, and that's, you know, how many dimensions this is. And last time you, you figured this out uh, very clearly. Does anyone remember what the dimensionality of this vector is? Yeah. There's 2 to the d, right? Why is it 2 to the d? Yeah, the, that's one way of, that's right. Another way to look at it is you just always have x1 to xd, and each one of them can be on or can be off, right? And then actually this way you get exactly two possible uh, options for each one of these terms. This is the option where everything is off, so everything is just one. Um, and here is basically, you know, everyone is on. So you have exactly two to the d possible switches. And that should scare the living daylights out of you, right? Because you could easily have a thousand dimensional data set, Two to the thousand is more than there's electrons in the universe, right? So there's no way you can possibly write down that vector. <clears throat> so it's great, but right now it's not very feasible, right? or only for very small data sets. Um, let's not get scared by this, um, and let's just continue and pretend we don't have that problem. That's kind of looming over our heads, right? So we want to do this stuff, um, but let's just, you know, ignore it for now. <clears throat> So what I want you to uh, show you today is, you know, basically two tricks how to deal with this. So we would like to extend the dimensionality of our data by kind of combining features with each other. That seems like a good approach. And uh, the problem is this is really high dimensional. That is, you know, uh, the first thing is that's really, really slow, and B, that needs a lot of memory. So the first thing I want to show you is just a simple trick. We basically, and I, I just, you know, that's, um, that's, a lot of mathematical reasons why you want to do this, but I now show you just a very pragmatic reason. And that's, well, one thing we can do is, uh, if you have a linear classifier, it turns out we can actually uh, express the linear classifier in terms of inner products. And if we only access our data through inner products, then we can pre-compute these. And therefore, we can kind of store them, compute them once, and then uh, during the training, we, we just uh, save them. So we just uh, pull them up. So, so let me just explain this. So let's say we have a matrix K. We say Kij equals Xi transpose Xj. Okay, so basically what I'm trying to convince you of, and this was part of the homework, so um, I kind of primed you here. So I think one homework ago you had to do this already, is, well, if I can express my entire classifier in terms of inner products, then one thing I could do is I could pre-compute the inner products. And the advantage is then I just have to look them up. I don't ever have to compute them. And you know, one reason you may want to do this is because you already have the feeling these are going to be really expensive, these inner products. <clears throat> okay, so let me show this that we can actually do this, right? That basically we can express everything in terms of inner products. And <clears throat> so let me for now just look at the square loss, just because I like the square loss, but it also holds for all the other losses that we actually talked about. <clears throat> so if I remind you, the square loss is W equals um, we sum over all our points, 1 to n, and the loss is w transpose xi minus yi squared. OK. <clears throat> so what's the gradient of this? The gradient, when we do gradient descent, is, please correct me if I'm wrong now, w transpose I'll leave this, xi minus yi xi. Okay, so this here is the last function, this here is the gradient. Let's call this G. Okay. <clears throat> so far, so good. Now I'm, sorry, the, the, the notes are a little bit different. I just realized just now on the, you know, as, as I walked over, um, that maybe I can explain this a little bit more condensed. <clears throat> so, Here's the trick. The first thing I want to convince you of is that at all times during our algorithm, this was part of the homework, if you remember, um, our W can be written as a linear combination of our inputs. 
So I claim that W equals 1 to n alpha i xi for some assignment of, alpha, uh, of alphas. Okay, so that's, that's a claim that I will show you and prove to you in a few seconds. Right? <clears throat> and if this is true, right, then actually think about this, what happens here, right? In this, we have the only access our data in terms of W transpose X, right? Here we only access our data in terms of W transpose X. Well, there's a little term here, but don't worry about this for now. So when we have W transpose X, well, W actually is this thing here, right? So what does W transpose X become? Let's say W transpose X J becomes the sum over I 1 to N alpha I X I transpose X J. Well, this here is just K I J. Okay, so just to, to be clear, what I'm trying to do here is to express everything in terms of inner products. Because then I can, then I can pre compute the inner products, save them somewhere in memory, and then just look them up every time I access one. Right? I don't actually have to compute them. And the nice thing is, now my vectors can be very high dimensional. It doesn't matter. As long as my inner products are pre computed, I'm good to go. Okay? Let's not worry about the pre -computation, computation of the inner products. So, <clears throat> all right, so when we, during training basically, you know, we only access our data through this W transpose X. If W actually has this form that it's just, you know, a linear combination of my X's, which I claim is true, and I will prove to you in a second, then actually everything is good, right? Then W transpose XJ for any vector XJ in my training data set just becomes this following thing, which is just, you know, the sum over alpha I and then KIJ. Any questions at this point? No? Okay, good. <clears throat> so let me briefly prove to you that alpha, uh, W really is of this form. Who remembers the proof from the homework? Wow. <clears throat> Wait, was it not on the homework? <laughs> it was on the homework, right? Okay. <clears throat> okay, I'm, well, I'm glad I didn't skip it. Um, who remembers there was a homework? <laughs> uh, a couple. All right, good. Uh, um, okay, good. So here we go. Uh, so here's the algorithm. We do gradient descent. The square loss is quadratic, so it's convex. So the beautiful thing is that we can initialize our W any way we want initially. So let's just say initially, I do it by induction, okay? Proof by induction. So W0 equals the all zero vector. That's how I start, right? I just start there because actually, if you have a convex function that you're minimizing, and you do gradient descent, it will always get to the minimum. It doesn't matter where you start. Right? You can start here, you can start here, it doesn't actually make any difference. So I choose the starting point, and I choose it to be all zero, right? And the reason I'm choosing it all zero is because now I can actually write, well, obviously that's a combination of my x's. What are the values of alpha in this case? It's all zero, right? Alpha i equals zero for all i. Okay? So check, right? We're good. Right? At the beginning, we start out, and our vector w is a linear combination of all our inputs. Great. Now we make it update. And so in some sense, assume basically the case already. Assume that now we have an iteration t, and w, I, uh, w equals sum over i equals 1 to n, alpha i x i. Okay, this is just proof by induction. Now we uh, use the induction hypothesis. Do you know proof by induction? Who knows proof by induction? Okay, thank you. Thank you. <laughs> All right. So we assume this. Now we do one more update. So what is the update? The update is W becomes W minus step size S times G. Okay? So what is G? G is, I have it up here. Is this term here, right? And the sum of i is 1 to n, 2 times this term here times xi, sum of all xi. Well, I can call this here gamma i. This is just a scalar, right? This here is a scalar, this is a scalar, this is just a scalar. So 
my g is gamma i x i. Okay? And so what does this mean? This means this becomes this here is my w is just alpha i x i, that's the induction hypothesis, minus s times g. Well, g is this thing, gamma i x i. And if you write this, what does this become? This becomes sum over i equals 1 to n, alpha i minus s gamma i x i. So this here is my new alpha. Right? So <clears throat> this actually proves, this is already, uh, we're done with the proof. Right? So it is true initially, all the alphas are zero. If it's true at the beginning of any iteration, it will still be true at the, uh, true at the end of the iteration. Right? We just change our alpha. Alpha i becomes alpha i minus s gamma i. Right? So another way of looking at this is what we could do is we could actually change the gradient descent algorithm by saying initially alpha i equals zero for all i. And now we iterate, we compute gammas, compute gamma i for, you know, uh, this is now the loop, compute gamma i, and then update your alphas by saying alpha i becomes alpha i minus s gamma i. And now loop around. <clears throat> Any questions? Yeah? Uh, that's fine. It's still just a number. Right? It's just a scalar. That's okay. Right at the end, you know, this is still just a linear combination of my axis. Right? Where this gamma comes from doesn't matter. Right? can put in the age of my mother-in-law, right? That's fine, right? It's, it, now it depends on the age of my, of my mother-in-law, but it doesn't actually matter, right? It's still a linear combination of the axis. Yeah. <laughs> Any more questions? Is this only true for linear classifiers? This is only true for linear classifiers. Okay. So what we are, we're trying to make, we're holding on to the linear classifiers. We want to make them more powerful, right? Because linear classifiers are beautiful. <laughs> okay, any more questions? Okay, awesome. So, here comes the beautiful thing. So now we can basically, we have our linear classifier, and we can basically write it, instead of actually ever computing W, right? We just have to compute N alphas. Now, why is that a big deal, right? Can anyone tell me why this is incredibly important when you deal with 2 to the D dimensions? Think about it. We started the lecture by saying we take our feature vector, right, and we map into some really high dimensional space. And now we learn a classifier there, right? This is 2 to the d. This is ridiculously di high dimension, right? If we would have to store the w vector in this ridiculously high dimensional space, we would use up all disks on the entire planet, right, even those in North Korea, right? <coughs> it's only a couple, but <coughs> so. What I just told you is we don't have to do this. All you ever need to store is n numbers, your n alphas, right? And that's independent of the dimensionality of your data, right? So the storage we need to do, to do this algorithm is independent of the data dimensionality, right? So that will allow us to go to really, really high dimensional spaces. Actually, by the end of the lecture, we will go to infinite dimensional spaces. Right? So that, you know, certainly reassuring that we don't have to store infinite dimensional W. <coughs> so, in, so basically, the way we now do gradient descent, we just store n data points where n is the number of data points. Uh, sorry, n weights, these alphas, where n is the number of data points, so it only scales with n. n is always finite, right? We only have a finite amount of data. Any questions about this? <coughs> okay. So... We can do the training 
um, by just storing these alphas. Um, how do you do testing? Well, if you do testing, your h of x is, this is a test point, this w transpose x, right? w is super, super high dimensional. We never computed it because we were way too scared about it. So what we do instead is we do the following. We say, well, this is just, w is just i equals 1 to n alpha i x i, and now we just have transpose x. OK, so now we can also do the testing without actually ever computing w. OK, so during, testing, during training and during testing, we never need w. w doesn't exist. <coughs> yeah? Yes. That's right. We still have to do dot products between x i and x, between two different x's. Right? That's exactly right. Right? And you couldn't have asked a better question right now. Because that's exactly the last piece, right? The last piece of the puzzle. So I can show you that we can also do that. <laughs> so the first magic trick in some sense is that we can train a linear classifier in this extremely high dimensional space without ever, ever computing the w that defines the hyperplane. We just have to store these alphas, one for every data point. And we wrote everything in terms of inner products. Now what he's saying is, wait a second, right? We still have to compute these inner products, right? So when you compute kij, that's xi transpose xj, right? Or here with a test point, you have to compute the inner product for every single training point with every single test point. Have you gained anything, right? That still seems very, very expensive. <coughs> All right, so here comes the second magic trick. Are you guys ready? All right, Arthur's ready. <coughs> oh, was that a no? <coughs> it was a yo. All right, good. <coughs> so let me just, let's just go back to the very beginning of the lecture where I showed you this, this description up here. Right? So let's just go with this for now and say we use this expansion, right? just because it's very, very convenient and uh, it would be awesome if we could do it. So, all right, here we go. So here comes the magic trick. So we call this here phi of x. x goes to phi of x. Now we want to compute the inner product between two such vectors. Let's call them x and z. So you want to compute, so this means x transpose z becomes phi of x transpose phi of z. OK? Any questions at this point? Raise your hand if you understand what I'm doing. OK, so basically we are mapping our data from this low dimensional space and this ridiculously high dimensional space, right? Scares you out of your pants, right? And but in this high dimensional space, we only have to compute in the products. That's the only thing we need to do. <coughs> Let's do it. So we have our, our data points. Now we have to compute the inner product between phi of x and phi of z. What does that mean? Well, we compute the inner product, product between this vector and the same thing with the z's. 1, c1, zd, c1, z2, c1, c3, c1, cd. OK? So if you write that out, what is this? Right? It's first these two multiplied. 1 plus x1, z1 plus x2, z2, plus, plus xd, zd, plus, and so on, and so on, plus x1, xd, plus uh, times c1, cd. OK? <clears throat> That's a massive sum. Right? It has two to the d different uh, terms that we sum up. But I claim, actually, if you think about this, what are we doing here? That's actually exactly 1 to d, the product between these terms. 1 plus xk, zk. And that's it. <sighs> and this only takes d iterations. This takes a few milliseconds. So this here takes, computing this, takes from now until the end of the universe, right? So, well, the solar system. Let's say the sun collapses, the Earth collapses into the sun, like, you know, 10 million years, or I don't know how many years, uh, maybe 5 billion years. 
This here takes 10 milliseconds. The answer is the same thing. You can choose right now which one you're going to do. <clears throat> so maybe spend a few seconds, you and your neighbor, and convince yourself that these two are actually exactly the same thing. All right. <coughs> Who thinks it's crystal clear why the two, those two are the same? Raise your hand. All right, it's a fair amount. Okay. So uh, essentially, what we are doing, right? If you basically take these these terms, right? We have one plus. Um, let's say we just have the simple case where we have x one and x two, and we blow this up, right? This becomes one x one x two x one x two, right? Um, if you take the inner product between two such vectors, um, this would you know, correspond to this, x1, uh, z1, 1 plus x2, z2. All right, so basically, every single, you basically take all the cross terms. right? You take 1, 1 times 1, that's the very top one, then 1 times x2, z2, then 1 times x1, z1, and then in the end, uh, these two cross terms, which is exactly what you get. Right? You get 1 plus x1, z1, plus x2, z2, plus x1, z1, x2, z2. Right? And that's basically all crossable across terms. So the, the number of cross terms you have is exactly 2 to the d, and that is the exhaustive list that we have here. Um, any questions about this? <coughs> so what I just showed you is that we, we take our data, right? we, we do kind of we do a crazy trick here. Right? We Take our data, we map it into some infinite, or not infinite, like exponentially high dimensional space, and we run our 
algorithm in this high dimensional space. But actually, we never once compute a single instance in that high dimensional space we can't, because we couldn't even afford it. Okay? But because we only need inner products in this high dimensional space, we can compute those very, very cheaply. So you have no idea what these vectors look like. You never have to compute this guy. Right? Because you, all you ever have to compute is the inner products between two such vectors. Right? You can do training in this in high dimensional space. Right? And the, the solution is exactly the same as if you would map your data up there. And it's extremely powerful. Because now you're, you're capturing any possible nonlinear interaction, or you know, a pairwise interaction between any two features. Yet you never compute a single one of them. Right? And the answer is exactly the same. So all you need to compute once is this kernel matrix Kij equals phi of xi transpose phi of xj right, for any two points, which is just order decomputation. Right? So each one of them takes a few milliseconds. Right? So it's not a big deal at all. So suddenly, we took a very simple classifier that just can make linear decision boundaries. It made it exceedingly powerful. Another way of looking at this is that all we need from our vector space is an inner product function. And you can also view this as kind of saying, we just redefine inner product. We say the inner product between two vectors is no longer just xi transpose xj. Instead, the inner product between two vectors is k of xi comma xj, where that is some kernel function. Right? And where that actually equals this. Right? So this here actually equals k of x comma z. Right? So I just define a new inner product. And I run my algorithm with this different inner product. And I know this is well defined because I know it corresponds to some extremely high dimensional vector space in which is just the good old inner product that you all remember right? from high school. Any questions? Yeah. Um, yeah, so the, you have to be careful now. The dimensions are no longer uh, they're particularly interpretable, right? Because you have uh, an excessive number of them, and they really kind of capture different uh, combinations of existing features. Um, but the notion of the margin is exactly the same. Like the classifier doesn't change at all. <laughs> yeah. The loss? So here's what you do. Um, where is it? No. Oh, I erased it. Sorry. OK, well, let me write it down again. So uh, the loss was the following, right? My loss was L of W was sum over i equals 1 to n. W transpose xi minus yi squared, right? So I did square, law, uh, square regression, OK? So now we, we realize that W can be expressed in terms of alphas, right? So I can write my whole loss in terms of alphas. And W becomes I equals one, uh, j equals 1 to n uh, alpha j xj transpose xi minus yi squared, right? Now I have everything in terms of inner products. Now I plug in my new inner product function. And I just say this is actually k of xi comma xj, which is this function up here. Right? And now I can just compute the loss. It takes, you know, sub-seconds. Right? No big deal at all. Super, super easy. And you take the gradient with respect to alpha. And you get exactly the gradient descent algorithm that we wrote down earlier. It works for all of the ones we talked about. Yeah? Good question. Um, no, you, you just use all of them, but because why not? Right? Because you could just assign zero weight to them. So, so here comes the crazy thing, right? 
So he's basically saying the following, right? He's saying, wait a second, you have this two to the d possible features, right? And some of them have capture interactions between features that I don't care about. I don't think there's any interaction between these two features, right? So why do we blow it up, right? But it's not a big deal because you assign a weight to each one of them, right? You have this gigantic weight vector w, and you can just assign zero weights to these, right? That you don't care. Now, the cool thing is that you never actually compute those, those w vectors, right? But implicitly, right, by choosing your alphas, you actually assign zero weights to these, right? So it's, it's, it's pretty crazy that, it, that you can do this, right, it's without ever computing the vector. Yeah? Sorry? If, if you're, is, oh, yeah, okay, good, good. So the question is, is it linearly, is the data now always linearly separable? Um, let, me, let me show me a few. So, so let, let me get back to this question in three minutes. So one thing I just, I just showed you, I just showed you this very, very carefully constructed feature expansion, right? Where we basically take every, any possible cross, you know, correlation between different features, and I showed you that that can be written in a, you know, in this very compact form. Right? The question is, is there other, are there other inner product functions that we could use? And turns out, actually, there's tons of them. Right? Tons and tons and tons of them. And you can make your own, actually. And if it catches on, you can name it after yourself. Or after some loved one or something. <clears throat> so let me give you a few examples of inner product functions that we, that we use. <clears throat> so the first one, and we call these kernel functions for, for good reasons. Because they're actually, what we're doing actually is we are, by doing this, we're actually mapping our data in a reproducing kernel Hilbert space that uh, actually is defined through that kernel. <clears throat> so the linear kernel function is very simple. That's just k of x comma z equals x transpose z. Right? If you use the linear kernel, the algorithm becomes the good old linear classifier that you're all familiar with, that you all like from, you know, <clears throat> that you did before the midterm. Um, another one is polynomial kernel. So here we say k of x z becomes 1 plus x transpose z to the power of p, actually, not d, p. Well, I can, you can call it d, whatever, it doesn't matter. Um, some constant. Just raise that to some constant. What that captures is actually, in some sense, now you get, uh, if, if p is 2, then you basically can model quadratic functions. If p is 1, it becomes the linear kernel exactly plus some constant, which doesn't matter, right? So then again, you're just learning linear functions. If it becomes quadratic, you learn quadratic functions. If it becomes, you know, uh, 3, then you learn cubic functions, etc. <clears throat> the most famous one, this is, like, this is like the Brad Pitt of kernels, right? This is like people, you know, sometimes faint when they see it. It's like, <clears throat> it's called the radial basis function. Oh, function kernel, yeah, function kernel. RBF, it's all good, RBF. And the RBF kernel, k of x comma z, is e to the minus x minus z squared over sigma squared. Oh, I can write this as, this is vectors, yeah. And so that should look familiar to you. Does anyone remember this? Does anyone know the cousin of the, the, um, of the RBF kernel? There's a Gaussian distribution, right? So, so the RBF kernel is so popular for various reasons. Number one, you can prove that it's a universal approximator. So what is a, is a, a universal approximator means that actually you can fit any function arbitrarily closely, given the few assumptions. So going back to your thing, your question, is now everything linear, linearly separable? And the answer is yes. Right? If you use an RBF kernel, suddenly every problem becomes linearly separable, provided you don't have two identical data points. Like, uh, the only exception is like if you have two data points that are identical and have different labels. You can't do it. But <clears throat> you know, taking that one point away, like, you know, that, you know, which is ridiculous, then um, 
actually everything becomes linearly separable. Right? So you can learn anything you want with just a simple linear classifier. The RBF kernel corresponds to, to a space that's infinite dimensional. Right? So you can't actually write down phi of x. Right? It corresponds that there exists some phi of x such that you know, k of xc equals phi of x transpose phi of c, but this is actually infinitely dimensional. So you can actually never write it down completely. Right? Um, but you can approximate it pretty well. Uh, that's arguably the most popular kernel. And if you, you know, in most problems, if you use one particular pro uh, kernel, that is, that is the one that usually works best out of the box. <coughs> in one, there's a connection with the Gaussian distribution, and here's, in some sense, what it does. Uh, what the RBF kernel does, it takes your data set and puts many, many little Gaussians around every single data point. This here is the Gaussian. This here is my training data point. Right? And sigma basically tells me how wide these Gaussians are. And <coughs> what you do is, uh, by doing this, basically, you get some weird space where you basically say, how similar are you to any given data point? And the reason you can basically approximate anything you want is because if you have enough, it's kind of like, it's similar to the nearest neighbor proof to some degree. But um, in some sense, basically, if you have enough training data, then actually there's always some training data point. You put a Gaussian around that data point, and that then defines a one dimension in your infinite dimensional space. Um, does that make any sense? <laughs> so it, it, you know, it's a little bit hard to kind of uh, picture these infinite dimensional spaces, but, but you, know, you get used to it. It's, um, it's a nice world to live in. Uh, there's a few more. Let me just think, you know, how much time do I have? I want to show you a little demo. Um, there's a few more kernels. I wrote them down. Few people use them. Uh, the most common one is, um, is, is the RBF kernel. Now here comes the important part, and let, next lecture actually we'll go to this, uh, into this a little bit more, that you know, the, the natural question is what is a well-defined kernel? Right? Can you just do anything? Can you just make my Killian kernel? Right? And just you know, take any kind of function and just say that's my, you know, take two inputs and say the output this is the kernel. And the answer is no. It has to be a positive and definite function. Um, so what does that mean? That means if I take compute this matrix K, for any set of vectors, that matrix set has to be positive semi-definite. Who knows what positive semi-definite means? Raise your hand. It was mentioned briefly on the homework. Um, so a matrix is positive, positive semi-definite if, if and only if there's a few definitions. So K is positive semi-definite. This is how we write this. If and only if for every vector Q, Q transpose KQ is greater than or equal to zero. And that's the case if and only if k can be decomposed into z transpose z. And <clears throat> another one is if all the eigenvalues are non-negative. And it's real and symmetric in this case. So this here is the one you really want. This, is, this should make it obvious why, um, why, why you have to have this definition. These z's, can anyone tell me why this is? Why, uh, why the, you know, if, if you know this is the case, then it must be a well-defined uh, well kernel. Can anyone tell me this? Yeah? That's right, that's right. That's exactly right. So each column here in Z is one particular phi of x, right? So these Zs are basically the really high-dimensional feature representations, right? Um, and if I just, in a, you know, basically you know now it's an inner product between, uh, it's an inner product function. Right? This doesn't have to be ridiculously high dimensional, and the reason is because this matrix K is only over a finite number of points, and if you have a finite number of points, they always lie in a finite dimensional space. Right? Uh, so you can just do PCA on those points. So that's why this doesn't have to be, in, so even if you have an RBF kernel, you can take the kernel matrix and compute these Zs. That's fine. You know, so the important thing is for any set of points, if you compute the kernel matrix K, um, you can do this decomposition. 
So that's basically, uh, that, that's, that's the only condition you have to have. So the beautiful thing about this is that that's extremely, that's extremely flexible, right? So once this came out, people went nuts, right? People in biology defined kernels of molecules, right? And over C DNA sequences, right? There's no vectorial representation. It, you don't need it, right? You just have to define some of the product matrix that's actually always positive semi-definite, right? So it's extremely powerful. You can define in the products over sentences, right? Over all sorts of weird data con uh, constructs. And now you can use all these linear classifiers, like SVMs, right? Suddenly they apply to data sets where you don't even know how to write a vector, right? Yet you can define a linear classifier. All you need to know that is in principle, there exists some mapping from this data into some infinite dimensional space, which I don't know, but it doesn't matter, because as long as I can compute in the products, I'm fine. So it's incredibly powerful. And when this came out, the whole you know, machine learning world went crazy. Right? This was in 2000, you know, this was basically with SVM, so uh, Corinna Cortez and Isabella Guillon. And, and they basically introduced this for their support vector machines. And that's why support vector machines became so incredibly popular. And for, I think for five, 10, 10 years, uh, the whole machine learning field did nothing else but you know, mapping everything into kernel spaces and analyzing these very, very thoroughly. Uh, let me show you a little demo that you see a little bit what this looks like in practice. Any questions while I'm booting the... Why are some kernels better than other kernels for certain data sets? Why are some... So you can have really terrible kernels, I guess. Um, right? The zero kernel maps everything to zero or something. Um, so what you want is that a kernel says similar points are similar when they have similar labels. Right? And so you can encode that if you know a lot about your data set. The better you encode that, the less data you need to train it. Yeah? Ultimately, people typically use the, the RBF kernel. But, yeah. Any more questions? Yeah? Uh, but we still limited by alpha, is it right? So basically, as long as we compute alpha is more accurate than we are, then alpha is far better. Uh, sorry, we are still limited by alphas. What does that mean? I mean, we compute alpha over iterations, right? So like, the more iterations we have, the more accurate alpha we get. That's right. No, it's convex. All these loss functions are convex. So you can, you can optimize them to arbitrary precision. So you can use the you know, second order method like the Hessian, and, and you, can, you can make this as precise as your computer can represent it. Um, OK, so let me show you this is an SVM. Um, well, let me actually first, OK. So here's an RBF. Uh, kernel. This is a rich regression. So rich regression just draws on points and, <clears throat> and now have the RBF kernel. So what you see is the following. Um, so what I'm changing here is basically my regularization term and my sigma. And down here actually, if my sigma is very, very wide, you can't see this because the blackboard is in front of it. Sorry. And this becomes the linear classifier. This becomes the Gaussians of the RBF kernel really, really wide. <clears throat> but if I just change my signal, I make it smaller, and that's, that's going upwards. And if I regularize less, right, then actually you see on top left, you get an extremely powerful classifier, right? So you basically, and here, somewhere in the middle, right, you get something that actually captures this, this data pretty well, right? Here, right, I basically become, you know, I have a variance problem, right? I'm totally over-specializing to every single point. I really have a spike that just hits exactly that point, right? So I'm memorizing exactly my training data set, right? That just shows you the RBF kernel can learn anything, right? But this is too much. That won't generalize well. But if you go down here in the middle, right, you see beautiful curves, right, that capture your data set very, very nicely, right? So what you now just have to do is you have to basically find your lambda and your sigma, basically find the right hyperparameters, and you can uh, learn any, any data set you want. Um, let me show you another demo for actually classification. So let's make some really nasty data set. Um, what's a nasty data set? Any ideas? Any suggestions? A smiley face. A smiley face. All right, good. So what are the two classes in the smiley face? Um, smile, I guess? 
So these are positive. What are the negative points? Oh, I see. Wait, wait, okay, wait. I guess I already made it wrong. So let me just do this. So let me just put the other ones all around it here. So this guy is like, you know, smiley person who has freckles. <laughs> <laughs> okay, good. So now let's run this, right? So this is now, now you're running a linear classifier on this, right? A few lectures ago, you would have laughed at me, right? Hopefully. <clears throat> so let's just do this. But well, this is a linear classifier. It was just if I run a linear classifier. It doesn't do anything. The decision boundary actually is so, so, it doesn't even draw anything. Um, it gets some precision errors. So this here is if I take a linear classifier and I now show you the prediction values uh, between positive and negative. And what you see is it classifies everything at point two because it has no idea what to do. <coughs> so now I run RBF kernel. Da da! Right? And so what you see here is. All right, so the blue is basically negative, the, the cross is the positive, and the, the white line is actually exactly the points that are one, one, in a, in a margin one away from the decision boundary. These are my support vectors, right? <clears throat> so we have the same thing. And by the way, this is a straight line in this high dimensional space, right? <clears throat> it's just curved, and, you know, because we are so limited, now, you know, <clears throat> in, in 2D. And I can now show you the value you know, how much a certain point is positive and how much is negative. If I now, this here is actually, and I can show you, know, I, I can now actually make, you know, show you this in 3D. And you see a landscape, right? Uh, <laughs> you see the smile, basically, right? Like it goes negative into these, it carves out these valleys. <sighs> All right, let's leave on a high note. See you next Friday. <sighs>